Well, uh, Pastor Paolo is not here today, but yeah, you may be seated. And um, remember that last month he got COVID, right? So Pastor Paolo, and that was when uh, one of their children, Ryan, uh, had his graduation from senior high. So they didn't get to celebrate, so they had to postpone their celebration to today. And so they're out today, and they're celebrating together as a family, you know, just to celebrate the goodness of God in their lives as God has allowed them to. For Ryan, that's not Ryan. That's, that's my family, okay? But I want to transition to this photo as well because I'm now officially a dad of a first grader. My, my, um, our eldest, hi, Thad, over there. He just graduated from kindergarten, so... Yeah, uh, praise God for that. And you know what? One thing I realized is that kids grow up so fast. They do. And so we want to make sure that we get to disciple them. We want to make sure that we are discipling the next generation leaders, right? That's our goal. That's our mission. But even as I say that, that how committed we are, how passionate we are in raising the next generation leaders or in making disciples, in doing small groups, I hope we understand that that's not all that we do here in church, all right? We also want to take care of those who are hurting, those who are suffering. In fact, if I could show you this picture, and by the way, don't have, it's not astigmatism, okay? I intentionally blur this one because we want to keep their identities uh, confidential here. One of our campus missionaries, her name is Ria. She started this group, and they call it uh, Grief Share. She's uh, facilitating their discussions with one of her mentors, one of her professors in their uh, master's course in counseling, all right? And so they've in invited some um, of our members here who suffered the loss of their loved ones during the pandemic. And so for me, wow, this is something that really resonates deep within my heart. And I, I know that this is something that strikes all of us on a personal level. Why? Because this is a beautiful picture of what the church is all about, yeah, where we could just be ourselves, we could uh, let our guards down, we don't have to wear masks, we can cry, we can share laughters with, our, with, with other believers, and that's a picture, that's a beautiful picture of the church. Yeah, and that's a beautiful picture of the church, and so we're thankful for Ria and, and her professor for doing this thing, and you know what? This is an expression of this verse, John 13, 35. When Jesus commanded us, what was the command? That we ought to love others. Let me read it. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. But you know what the tragedy is? In our big vision thinking of, you know, we want to set up conferences and seminars and classes and all those things. And by the way, these are all good things, right? Sometimes we forget the simple commandment of just loving our neighbors, of just extending care and concern to our neighbors. And in fact, in our selfishness sometimes, you know, isolating ourselves from the rest of the world, we forget. We sort of take this for granted. You know, this important commandment of loving our neighbors. So much so that according to many pieces of research, that one of the, or not one, but the primary reason why people leave church, you know what the primary reason is? Research shows that it's really relationships. Relationships. First, because people somehow don't feel connected. Well, because for the lack of relationships in their lives in a church community, or secondly, because they've been hurt by the church. They've been hurt from within the church. And so I want to speak to all of us on a personal level today that if you've been hurt, if you ever felt like the church abandoned you, the church left you out at your most difficult time, most difficult season in life, if you, or if you ever felt like you were just a number in the crown, you're just a a statistic, and your life doesn't matter here in this church, I want to apologize. We are sorry. We are deeply sorry if you ever felt that way. And the reason why we're having this series, okay, I know that I started with this sobering story right there, but we, are, we, we have started this series, We Your People, because we need to go back to how Jesus meant the church to be. That he has designed this church or our church so that we can have shared lives, so that we can have a shared faith, a shared hope, 
and a shared mission. And today we see a pattern set by the apostles in um, Acts 2, 40 to verse 47 of how the church ought to be. And as we read this passage, Acts 2, uh, 40 to 47, I'd like to invite all of us to try to go back in time and put ourselves in the shoes of these men and women, the early church, okay? So if you could uh, read with me just silently, Acts 2, 42 to 47. Okay, where's the book of Acts again? Okay, there you go. So Acts 2, 42 to 47, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Please uh, join me in a word of prayer as we take time to thank the Lord for the word he's given us today. Heavenly Father, as we look into your word today and see the pattern of how the church should be according to, you know, the early church, how it was patterned for us, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and would you sanctify our hearts so that we would be receptive to the truths that you want us to learn today the principles that you want us to apply. And if there are changes that need to happen in our lives, I pray that you would give us the grace, the willingness to allow you to do the work that only you can do in our lives. So thank you, God, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I don't have cults, by the way. It's just that the worship was so powerful. So if I could just have uh, this one, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. You don't have to clap for that, by the way. I don't know why you're clapping. Pastor Brandel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's okay. I don't, I don't need a table. Thank you. So, yeah, Acts 2, 42 to 47. So to give us a context of what happened here, remember that this was a time when the apostles met the risen Christ, all right? So he died, but he resurrected again. And then after a few days, he ascended back to heaven. So the apostles witnessed all of those things. And now a few days after the Lord Jesus um, ascended back to heaven, there's this uh, feast or a festival in Jerusalem called the Day of Pentecost. So imagine thousands and thousands of people gathering in Jerusalem, coming from afar and all, perhaps the animals and all the mess they left behind, right? I think the parking lot really had a lot of mess over there. But just imagine, I know here in the Philippines, we have several festivals, right? Like uh, Pahiyas, Panagbenga. What's that one in Cebu? Sinulog, Sinulog, that's the one. So you can just imagine with me how festive the event was. But in the middle or in the midst of all of that, here, here goes Peter. He was preaching his heart out. He was shouting from the top of his lungs. He was quoting from the Old Testament, you know, from memory. All right, and he was confronting and rebuking the people. And here's what he said in Acts uh, two thirty six: God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus, whom you crucified, it's like telling the people, "You murderers! This this is our God. You crucified him, but God made him both Lord and Christ." Now imagine the courage of Peter. From someone who was scared when he was confronted by a young girl, right? And he denied Jesus three times. Imagine the transition. All because he encountered the risen Christ. And he said this, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Wow. Can you imagine the courage of having to say these words to strangers, by the way, to the visitors in Jerusalem, right? But here we see how the people responded. We see in verse 37, they heard this and they were cut to the heart. They were convicted. And then they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? 
And so Peter immediately responds, you, you've got to repent and you've got to get baptized. So that was his response. And you know what, what these uh, actually 3,000 people, what, you know what they did? They literally, on that same day, they got baptized. 3,000 of them. Can you imagine that? I know that here we do water baptism, right? And then I think the most number we've had was like, um, I think last March we had around 100 people. And we did that for a couple of hours maybe. But imagine 3,000 people getting baptized and all the extra clothes needed, right? Because they didn't bring extra clothes, right? So if you were a seller of, what, RTW clothes, I think you would have made a lot of money selling those RTW clothes. But anyway, just like that, the church suddenly exploded from a church of 120 people to now a massive crowd of 3,000 plus people. That's unheard of. That's almost impossible. But how many of you know that nothing is impossible with God? He can save people by tens, by hundreds, by thousands, even by the millions. And He can save even the ones, the ones that we love, whom we think the hearts are hardened and callous. He can save even those people that we've been praying for for the longest time, right? And so this church, this early church had no building, like this one, they had no theological seminaries, they had no staff, no, no Miss May over here, no TSM, no volunteers. But what they had was something that was admirable. It, it was one thing that set them apart. And we can learn a lot from their example. Now here's what they had. Acts 2.42. What set them apart? What made them unique? It's this, they devoted themselves to something. Now, before we move on, I want to explain this word devoted because this is a powerful word. It means to actually continue steadfastly, to persevere in the midst of difficulty. So it's not just, you know, I love to do this thing. This is my hobby. No, it's not like that. It's like there's a sense of I'm committed to doing this. I'm going to press on. I'm going to persist. I'm going to persevere. So that's how it is to be devoted. So they devoted themselves to this thing called fellowship. All right, one of the things they devoted themselves to. So fellowship. And I know that we often hear this word fellowship, right? And we simply try to add word fellowship to all the things that we do, activities like, you know, if we're biking, so we call it uh, biking fellowship, or bi- bikers fellowship, or what else? Basketball fellow uh, for girls. What's a usual fellow? Not makeup, right? Makeup fellowship, or, or uh, yeah, could be. Or what else? Uh, video care fellowship. But I think fellowship is something much deeper than that. Actually, it's more spiritual in nature and in meaning. It's so profound, and it's actually an essential part of our Christian walk. In fact, I would like to propose to you that. It is impossible to thrive in our Christian walk, in our faith in God, apart from this thing called fellowship. And if you're not convinced, I want to show you some uh, studies here of why it's important to be in fellowship. And of course, we cannot live alone. Life is meant to be shared. That's why we cannot just go on uh, playing with our mobile games in the privacy of a room for hours and hours each day. That's not sustainable. Because we need to interact with others. Life, again, is meant to be shared. And it's in fellowship where we get encouraged. It's in fellowship that we get strengthened. It's in uh, fellowship that God provides encouragement for us. And just to support that with a study by the Harvard Gazette, they say that embracing community helps us live longer and be happier. How many of you would like to live longer? And to live happy lives, all right? I'm not, not going to preach uh, health and wealth, uh, prosperity gospel here. But I'm just telling you that even secular studies would support this uh, truth that we all need to be in relationships, in community, in fellowship. Another part of that study, they say that the key to healthy aging, wow, how many of you would like to age gracefully, uh, healthily, right? Three things, relationships relationships, relationships. So fellowship is of utmost importance to our Christian walk, to our walk with God. Now, if we go back to verse 42, we will see like the components of the fellowship. Because of course, there's something unique with how we do fellowship. 
all right? Unique from how the rest of the world does it. Why? Because if you go outside, you can have your drinking buddies, you can have all those kinds of fellowships, right? But what sets our fellowship apart? So we want to dissect the anatomy of fellowship here, beginning with this one. It says here in verse 42 that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So their fellowship was centered on the apostles' teaching. And again, we, from the context that I gave, we remember that the apostles just saw the recent Christ. So they were preaching so passionately, so boldly, and everyone got so excited. Because imagine if, if, if this guy who, uh, who said that he was going to die, he was going to raise up, and he was able to pull it off, right? He said that, and it really happened. I think whatever this guy says, I'm going to believe. I'm going to be willing to lay my life down for this guy. So I'm going to do it. So in the same way, the apostles became so passionate in preaching whatever God said in his word because they realized that, wow, this is indeed the word of God. Wow, all the prophecies about Jesus were true. Wow, when we talk about the lineage of Christ, how he was born, how he was going to die, and everything about Jesus Christ were true or was true. So they became so passionate. And as they were preaching, the people responded. And people kept getting added into the church. And as we see in uh, verse 46, this is what happened. So the people, as they hear, <coughs> excuse me, as they hear the word of God being preached to them every single day, they, they went to the temple every, what's happening to me? A while ago, it was, uh, um, it's a worship again. Okay. Yeah. How's everyone? You can just talk to the person beside you right now. <laughs> Fellowship, yeah. Thank you, Pastor Brandon. So, um, uh, and then again, because everyone was convinced of the authority, of the power, of the truthfulness of God's Word, then the people got so excited. They wanted to attend the worship service every day, not just weekly, but every day to listen to the apostles preaching, Right? And if you think about it, that is so unusual. That is so weird because why would you be wasting several hours of your time each day just to hear the Word of God? Why? You could do something much more important, right? Why would you waste your precious time on the Word of God? That's so unusual and that's so weird, right? Are they weird? Or perhaps where we are the weird ones. Because have we forgotten that we are supposed to be men and women <clears throat> who meditate on the Word of God day and night? Have we forgotten that? When was the last time we treasured God's Word more than our daily bread? When was the last time we woke up excited to dig into the Word of God, His love letter for us? And when was the last time we wanted to devour not just read a few verses, but devour the Word of God to see His glory and to see His beauty more than anything else. Do you still remember that time when you had that moment with the Lord? And so these guys thought that the daily intake of the Word of God is not optional because it's their life support. And the same thing for us, the daily intake of God's Word is not optional because it's our life support. I think I've uh, told you before that I do meet with <clears throat> 13 to 17-year-old boys weekly for our small Bible study. It's blurred again. Um, but, but here's the thing. Last Tuesday, interesting, we had an interesting discussion because I opened the floor for questions. I encouraged them to ask any question they wanted to the group. And so the questions range from, What's the difference between Calvinism and Arminianism? Pastor Brandon, so we had a deep th theological discussion about that. But one of the questions uh, was this. How do you court a girl? So interesting, right? How do you court a girl? Oh, they're, they're on the other side. I'm, I'm trying to check if they're here. But anyway, how do you court a girl? So my answer was, that's the easy part. You know, and this is coming from a person who... who who's gotten rejected several times in the past, okay? So it's not an arrogance that I'm saying that. I'm saying that because that's the easy part. I told them you can easily Google that. You can YouTube that because it's a learnable skill. But the harder part is this. What do you do next after the girl says yes to you and you get into a relationship and 
you know, because of hormones and all those things, you're going to get tempted to compromise in the area of purity. And that's for sure. And you're going to get tempted to explore. And the only place, the only venue that God wants for you to explore is in, is in the, or within the boundary of marriage. So my question to you is, are you going to be willing to settle down to get married like in the next few months? And we're talking about 13 to 17 year olds here. So, oh, okay, okay. So, you know, we had a good discussion about that. And so we, we tried seeking the scriptures together. So what does the Bible say about this? Maybe uh, God wants us to be faithful in whatever he's put on our plate. School, you know, academic sports, whatever, or responsibilities at home. Maybe that's God's plan for you in the season of your life. And what does it say in the Bible? Song of Songs. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. So there's that issue of self-control, of, of uh, doing things at the right place and at the right time. So I just loved it. That we get to center our discussion on the Word of God. Because again, we, fellowship is centered on God's Word. That's the point I'm getting to, that our fellowship, what makes our fellowship unique is it's always centered on the Word of God. Now back to verse 42. Another component of uh, the fellowship thing right here is this, the breaking of bread. So they didn't just go to the temple to attend worship service, right? But they also broke bread, like the communion that we had a while ago, right? So breaking of bread, we're not just talking about the communion table here, where we would remember what Christ, our Lord and Savior, did for us on the cross, what He accomplished for us on the cross. It's not just that, but we're talking about the common table here. Sharing meals, sharing laughters, sharing tears together, sharing our prayer requests. And you know what? I think as I'm explaining this to us, maybe some of us are probably thinking, you know, I cannot do that. I cannot just be uh, sharing meals with those people I don't know. You know, first and foremost, because I have small kids, you know, the house is messy. You know, I don't have a big enough space to entertain guests. Or maybe if you give me some time to have my, or, or get my dining area renovated, things like that. And you know what? Bread, we're talking about carbs here. You know, I'm on keto diet. I'm, I'm, I'm a carnivore. I think that's, that's the thing right now. I'm a carnivore. I'm, I'm, I, I want gluten-free. But if we're talking about uh, pita here with hummus, you know, that's something I might consider because I really love that. But, you know, we have all these excuses. But the issue really is not the place nor the food, but the issue is that I think somehow we like building walls or a wall around us and telling people, not really telling them, but in our mind, thinking that, you know, I want to be by myself. I don't want to entertain anyone here. I just want to enjoy my life. That's the thing. That's the issue. But if we take that challenge of or sharing meals with other people. You know what happens? Suddenly that wall or, or that wall comes crushing down. And God allows us to all of a sudden let people in. God allows us to let other people speak into our lives. And in fact, he allows us to start sharing, maybe not at the first meeting, but eventually along the way to share who we really are with other people. Because again, life is meant to be shared. This is God's desire for us. This is healthy. This is beneficial for us. All right. So I think the question is, are we willing to risk opening up our lives to others through shared meals? Now, another component, and by the way, I want to share this one with us. It's strengthened, that our fellowship is strengthened by the breaking of bread together. So the last one, the last component of fellowship is this. They soak, they bathe their fellowship in prayers. And prayer was something that seasoned their fellowship. And by the way, I think this is the only place where it's okay to be a marites, right? Uh, For the internationals right here, it's mare anong latest. Sis, what's what's new or or what's the latest in your life? I think as long as we add, how can I pray for you? I think it's going to be okay, right? Uh, Mare, sis, what's the latest? How can I pray for you? And I'm thinking if there's a male counterpart, is there a male counterpart for no? So we can just uh, invent one prego. Pre, anong bago? So it's like... uh, uh, bro, 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 what's new? Bro, what's up with you? How can I stand in prayer with you? Always remember that last part so that at least we can redeem that 
Maritiism right there, okay? Now, prayer makes it uh, legal. And I'm just kidding. But look at what happened uh, with the early believers as they decided to bathe their fellowship in prayer. Acts 2.43, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now, prayers are powerful because we have a powerful God who hears and answers our prayers. And God touches many lives in a miraculous way when we begin to pray. And I've heard, I've seen, or I've heard countless stories of prayers being answered by God. And then again, in our discussion last Tuesday with with our small group, um, so amazing. Now, one of the guys uh, last week, he asked, the group, if we could pray for him because he, he took this exam. He's in Malaysia, so he took this entrance exam uh, for an international school. So he was kind of nervous because he said it was a difficult exam. But you know what? Last Tuesday, uh, he shared a praise report with us. You know, I got in. They, they accepted me. I passed the exam. So that's an answered prayer. Now another powerful story. That's Tina, the one beside me on the photo. Uh, Tina, I met her last March uh, when she publicly declared her faith in Jesus Christ through water baptism. So that's Tina. Now, the thing with Tina is that a few years ago, she lost her ability to speak. She lost her voice because of thyroid cancer. All right? So the doctor said that it's impossible for you to, to ever recover your voice. So that's what the doctor said. All right? And then, uh, same time, she connected with Dr. Gink in Deepan, one of our leaders. I don't know if Dr. Gink is here, but anyway, they got connected and uh, they, they, start, they started learning the Bible together with the other ladies in their group. They, she started growing in her walk with God until such time that, you know, Dr. Gink had this, uh, in her heart, she was wrestling with God because she, she had this prompting from the Lord that, you know, it's about time that you uh, empower Tina to start leading the group. Now she was wrestling with that idea because how can you empower someone to start leading a group if she couldn't even talk, right? Because the whole time she was just using that chat feature uh, to, to, you know, to join in, in their discussions, right? In the small group discussion. But as she was about to tell Tina, miraculously, she got healed. Her voice recalled. Can you imagine that? How is that even possible? So things like this, we get to experience as we bathe our fellowship in prayers. And that's something that is very unique whenever we do fellowship. How we get to pray for others, how we get to see our prayers being answered by God. It's amazing, right? So if we remain persistent in prayer, let's take note of this. That God will do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or think. As we fellowship with others, our prayer life is cultivated. Amen. Now, continuing on verses 44 and 45. I'm going to read through these, but I want to share with us some of the misconceptions about fellowship. Okay, misconceptions, meaning, uh, yeah, let me just read these verses. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. So one of the misconceptions about fellowship is this. All things in common, right? We hear that phrase, not a lot, but I I think we've heard that before. And sometimes we think that it talks about communism, but the thing is, it's not. This is not communism. Communism, because first of all, no guns were pointed at their heads, uh, forcing them to give everything away. No, they were doing it voluntarily and gladly. So major difference there in the manner. They were doing it voluntarily, versus mandatory or or because they were required, and the motive, because they're doing it for the glory of God. Difference, big, big difference. So it was different. And they were selling their possessions, distributing or or distributing the proceeds to all who had need. It's like, are we going to be willing to sell our cars? If you have vacation homes, are you going to be willing to sell those and maybe liquidate our um, financial investments, our insurance plans, and give the money to those with bigger emergencies in life. You know, I'm thinking about it. Would I be willing to even let go of my emergency fund to have somebody with a bigger emergency? 
that's going to be hard, right? And to be honest with you, I don't think I'm going to have the, you know, the courage to do that because I, have, I also have kids to take care of. But you know what? God would sometimes prompt us to do just that, to sacrificially give, right? Because He wants to challenge our sense of security. That's the thing. Because sometimes we think that our security is found in, in how many insurances we have or uh, the reserves that we have in a bank. But no, our most secure place is not when we're fully insured, when, we, when our businesses are thriving. No, it's in the hands of the Almighty God. That's our most secure place. And if I may add, our most secure place is when we are doing the will of God. So fellowship is not about communism. That's the first one, the first misconception. The second one is this. It's not a country club. There you go. It's not a country club. Membership. What does this mean? Because in a country club, it's all about me and me and what uh, the club can give me, right? It's all about you. But here it's different. We see that they are selling, they are distributing, they're helping, they're serving, all those outward-focused activities, right? Right? And so that's the difference. It's not a country club membership. Because if we're going to think about a church as a country club, then this is the only organization whose focus is outward or who who exists for its non-members. Have you ever thought about that? Like we exist for the non-members. Yes, we're here to worship the Lord, to do things together, but our mission are the lost who are yet to have a relationship with God, right? So can you imagine that major difference? And then finally, it's this. It's not a click. Fellowship is not a click. There were no clicks with them and no, notice how inclusive their fellowship was. I underlined the word all here and it was mentioned three times. So they were pretty inclusive, not exclusive, right? I think they were inviting everyone into their homes, breaking, we- uh, breaking bread with just anyone. Like maybe the rebel who wanted to topple the government down, the corrupt tax collector, Who else? The beggar on the street, the ordinary fisherman, the sexually immoral, all these kinds of people. The pink supporters, the red supporters, the green supporters, the yellow supporters, all those we've supported, all those we've unfriended, everyone is welcome. Because at the end of the day, this is beyond our preferences. This is beyond our political agenda, whatever. Because there is something here that is beyond ourselves. Something bigger than our preferences. That we would be willing to overlook offenses. And it's the same thing with them. Because, you know, we naturally gravitate toward people who are like us. That's our tendency because we want to be affirmed uh, by those. Of course, we have the same opinion, same perspectives, right? But what does the Bible say in Galatians 5.14? For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, including those who are very different than you. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to love our neighbors, even those who are much, much different from us? So fellowship is not communism. It's not a country club membership, and it's not a clique, right? And then finally, as we land this message, I want to bring us back to the ultimate mission, why we're doing fellowship. We've talked about the benefits of fellowship, the anatomy of fellowship, the misconceptions, but what is the mission of fellowship? Acts 2.47, as we try to land this message, it says here, praising God. We see the results of their fellowship. The one, they started praising God together and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. And to give us another picture, another angle of this uh, result here. This, this uh, quotation from Fa- Francis Schaeffer from the book Mark of a Christian, and I love his statement right here. He said that our relationship with each other is the criterion the world uses to judge whether our message is truthful. Christian community is the final apolog- What's apologetic? It's like the thing that draws people to Christianity. This is going to be the thing that would make people believe that there is a God. When we see how we sacrifice for one another, when people see how we uh, hold one another accountable, when we see how much we are willing to serve one another despite our flaws, despite 
the messes in our lives, when people see that, they're going to be drawn to the Lord and that will result in praises and people getting added, not just into the church, but into his family. Because at the end of the day, this is a family, right? Right? This is a family. And so we want to fight for our fellowship. We want to fight for our community. If I could invite everyone to please stand as we take some time to let the words sink in, sink deep in our hearts, and take some time to allow God to minister to us. I have two things in mind. The first one, since I mentioned about this matter of cliques, this matter of us versus them, this matter of the cancel culture, and maybe some of us have experienced maybe being canceled or, or something like that, right? Maybe all of us have experienced it at one point, a certain extent. And I believe that God wants to heal relationships today because there's something here that is beyond ourselves. He wants us to devote ourselves to Him. And as a result of that, we should be willing to overlook offenses and to fight for our family, to fight for our church community. So let's take a moment to pray. Lord, would you forgive us for how we've become instigators maybe, how we've become enablers or how we've tolerated division, how we've tolerated harsh words, how how we've tolerated rudeness from within our ranks, Lord. And we are sorry. We apologize, God. If we've been hurt, if we've been offended, Lord, God, would you heal our hearts today? Lord, you said in your word that we can forgive because you have forgiven us. When we think about all of our offenses against you, God, it's a lot. But we thank you, Lord, that you count no record of our sins. That as far as the east is from the west, that's how much you forget our sins. How much you take away our sins from us, Lord. And so, Father, would you give us the grace today to maybe reach out to somebody we've offended or to somebody who has offended us. Lord, would you give us the grace? I know it's impossible apart from your grace in our lives. So we ask you today, Lord, as your children, we want to fight for this family. We want to fight for this community, Lord. So give us that grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One last thing. One last thing. Um, this thing about yeah, getting connected or staying connected. You know, it's easy for us to start looking for a group if we are going through a difficult time, right? Because we need people to be praying for us. We need people to be encouraging us, right? So it's, it's like, it's going to be our default response. We want to get connected. But you know, if you're maybe doing well in your life and you feel like there's not, there, I don't care about victory groups. I don't care about fellowships. I don't need this right now. I want to invite you. Don't wait for the time when you're desperate before you look for people who can encourage you, can speak into your life. This is the right time. Today is the right time. And so I want to invite everyone Talk to us. Allow us to help you look for a community. Let's not even call it a group, but a community. Maybe it's just a person. Maybe it's a group of people who would be willing to fight your battles with you. So I want to encourage you with that. And also, yes, we need the church, right? For encouragement, for, for you know, for the church to add value into our lives. But, but here's the thing as well. I believe that the church needs us because everyone, look around you. All of us here, everyone here has a place in the church where we can add the most value. What do I mean? There are opportunities for us to serve. There are opportunities for us to volunteer so that we can build the kingdom of God together. In fact, I want to show you. Serve with us. Segue, you know. Uh, Serve with us through the volunteer ministries. No, I'm serious here. I'm serious here. We take this seriously. There are so many opportunities for us to get involved. And it's important because we're doing this for the honor and glory of God. Because we want people to know God. And if we're not going to do this together, it's going to be a difficult job. We need each of you to contribute, right? You have gifts and talents that are being wasted right now. Remaining hidden, God wants to bring those gifts out. As you volunteer in Kid Church, as you volunteer in the ushering ministry, and all of our volunteer ministries, we can do our part. That's 
God's desire for each one of us, okay? So let's pray. Lord, we thank you that in your family, everyone matters. Lord, we have a part to play. We are all part of that jigsaw puzzle. And if we're like a body, then if one of us is, is you know, is, is taken out, then because we're a body. Some of us are the eyes, ears, nose, mouth, appendix. In this, All of us have a part to play. If you take out one part of the body, then it's not going to function effectively anymore. And so, Father, I pray that we would realize that truth, that it's your plan for us to take an active involvement in the church. Maybe in this church, maybe in a different church, as long as it's your body, it's okay. This is not... For, for the church per se, but this is for us. It's beneficial. It's good for us, Lord. And so, Father, that's the challenge that we will take on this week. We are making that commitment, Lord. We will hear from you and we will do what it takes, Lord, to serve you as we serve others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to take some time to sing to God again. Would you like that? So that this week, we can just overflow with the love of God and continue hearing from Him and continue serving Him. So may I invite all of us to please uh, worship with us. When I'm with you, I come alive. Taste full of God, dance through the night. I see you move, follow you me. My eyes are on you, yours are on me. Cause when I'm with you, I come alive. Taste full of color, dance through the night. When I see you move, I follow your lead. My eyes are on you, and yours are on me. My taste full of color, dance through the night. When I see you move, I follow your lead. My eyes are on you, and yours are on me. give a word of benediction for each one of us. Romans 15, 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. May we leave this place with that commandment or with that truth, Lord, from you. God, we thank you. Such a different 
it's a different thing for us Christians, for us children of God, that we can leave this room with this one, Lord. Yes, we will do this for your glory and for your glory alone. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. See you around.